And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple, coming to us straight from MS Edizioni. Creators, uh, creators of the upcoming Fantasy World pro project for Powered by the Apocalypse. The uh, one, the one and only Alessandro Pierodi. How you doing today, man? Or tonight, in your case, I guess. Uh, this evening. It's seven uh, p.m. here. And uh, hi, nice to be here. Nice, to, nice to have you. Nice to have you on. So, a tradition around here, aside from the rampant drinking is to open with the humble beginnings, in a sense. Hmm. And with that in mind, I'd like you to walk me through your first encounter with role-playing games, and what was it that made it stick for you? Ooh, uh, that's quite a long time ago. Um, I was, I remember it clearly in, uh, what's the equivalent in English? Uh, the second year of middle school, Basically, in Italy, we have five years of elementary, then three of middle, and then we get to high school. Um, and I was playing a ton of the Hero Quest board game uh, with a friend. We melted it. We uh, hacked it into extra expansions. We, we couldn't have enough of it, but we just had that box. And so we kept playing with that. And I was into similar games. And then one day, a friend comes to me and says, hey, have you heard of this game? It's called Dungeons and Dragons. And I was like, no, never heard of it. How is it like? And he tried to explain it to me. And I was extremely puzzled because I couldn't fathom how a game, a board game, could work without a board, without miniatures, without a lot of the trappings of Hero Quest. Uh, but he was pitching to me the red box, the old red box of the basic set. Uh, and so that was that. So he picked my curiosity. He uh, uh, gave me his uh, books. And I started reading. And I organized some games. And uh, I was hooked ever since. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> now, what, now, um, Obviously, in some cases, I've seen I've seen people I've seen um, instances where people are D are D and D lifers, um, but ob obviously, since Fantasy World is using P is using PBTA, that's not that's not the case. Um, <laughs> yeah. Where how did you how did you first get tuned into um, to the Apocalypse World system? Was it Apocalypse World itself? Was it Dungeon World? Was it an, what or was it another? Um, PBTA project? Um, so let's see. Uh, after Dungeons and Dragons, I went on playing a lot of other games uh, that I usually define traditional as a kind of design or family of design. Mm -hmm. uh, Call of Cthulhu, um, Shadowrun, Cyberpunk 2020 at the time. <laughs> Uh, actually, I think the first one was 2013. I even played. I never yeah, remember the, the right the number. Thir the, the first one, the um, the first one in Cyberpunk was um, was 20 was 2013. Actually, let me let me check my um, let me check my records on that. Because in Italy we got the American stuff a few years after it was actually published. Mm -hmm. Uh, in a professional way, and so it, there was this lag. And so while I wasn't, uh, I, I would have been too young to play that in America, probably, uh, when it first came out. Oh, uh, I was oh, yeah. just the right age when it landed in Italy, finally. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, dub I double-checked. Um, 2013 was the first edition, then Perfect. 2020, then third edition, which nobody talks about. <laughs> it doesn't exist. Um, and then and then finally red. I'm red. I have the I have my PDFs of of third edition, but there but there are um issues <laughs> with third <laughs> yeah. edition, and because of that, it's in it's in the hall of we of uh, we don't talk about that. 
Right I up, agree. Right up there um, with Legend of the Five Rings Second Edition. Hmm. I never played that set, uh, that that system. I know about it by fame, but mm -hmm. never played that. Uh, nor Seven Seas, for example. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I played uh, Vampire Masquerade and a ton of other World of Darkness stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and then um, uh, also strange little things. Uh, I remember th there was this one. Uh, we had a lot of shops in Rome at the time. Mm -hmm. But in my area, I had this one. It was called uh, La Terra di Mezzo, Middle Earth. And it had this shelf of role-playing games. And of course, 90% of that was... Dungeons and Dragons, even at the time, mm -hmm. uh, we call talking late 90s, early 2000s, 2000, yeah. Uh, but he also had some gems from all over. So I there picked up my copy of first edition Slay Industries, this Scottish role playing game, super mm -hmm. dark, far future, crazy setting, amazing. Um, and so I played that with various groups of friends for a lot of years. Mm -hmm. And then I think, yeah, around uh, 2000 something, some of the new indie things started to dripple into Italian uh, playing circles. And at the beginning, my reaction was less than favorable. <laughs> uh, I had a lot of issues with the hair, say, like, people talking uh, to you about these crazy new things that would revolutionize everything. And then I tried to read some rule books and they felt weird. Some were disappointing because they felt like all the rules were missing. Uh, and what was there was obvious and useless. It's, and others, yeah? It, I can definitely see that. It's, pr it's probably because a lot of those were in that phase of... Uh, we're we're still in that phase of this is something that was being played by one by one tape by one specific table at that at that point and not and not um played by everybody yet. Uh, a bit. I, I think the problem was that um, when you play traditional games for a lot of years and that's the only thing you play as a role playing game, uh, you build a set of habits that gets really deeply ingrained and entrenched. And I mean, that's true for most of any activity you do exclusively without knowing that something different exists. So when something different comes along and says, hey, we smell the same, we are doing the same thing in different ways, mm -hmm. uh, depending on the approach, uh, this can come across poorly. You might miss something. And that was definitely my case because I remember one of, the, uh, I used to uh, live on a forum at the time and I had epic and aggressive <laughs> discussions uh, with promoters of games like Dogs in the Vineyard, for example, mm -hmm. or the very first edition of uh, the, the beginning of Apocalypse World. And I, I was not getting what all the fuss was about and probably the, the diplomatic skills of the new enthusiasts at the time were not so smooth. Uh, and so it came across as uh, arrogant, L like they were saying, I didn't know how to role play. Uh, I needed this book to tell me how to play. And I don't know if in America it's the same, but at least in Italy at the time and still uh, in most places that I've been, um, the role-playing game tabletop culture has this weird idea that the game, your favorite game maybe, uh, is super important. It's the thing. You almost identify with the brand. I play d and I am a D&D &D player. I play Call of Duty, etc. But then at the same time, the, the game, the rules are not that important. You can do without. A truly good game master, a truly skilled group play much better without bothering with the rules. And so strangely, the best of rules are the ones that get less in the way, which um, has merit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does. Please interrupt me whenever, because otherwise <laughs> I go free-flowing. 
stop yeah, me. Yeah, when it, I um, I can I can certainly I can certainly see that and that that whole that whole thing of some like like I said some a lot of times some people are lifers when it comes to one particular um one particular type of game, um, it's definitely it's definitely something that I see a lot and I saw a lot in, in discourse. Um, D and D, especially of of course, because you know flagship and all that. Yeah. But I, but um, on to play a to play a bit of devil's advocate. Mm -hmm. I, um, I think a lot. Of, I think a lot of people, especially in the two thousands, um, going about how about how this or that system would re would revolutionize, was kind of tempting fate. Um. And I've and I've and I've repeatedly said over the years, word to the wise, never use the term revolutionize in in your sales pitch. It I never, wholeheartedly agree. It's it's kind it's kind of like a it's kind of like a um a video game claiming that claiming that it's a claiming that it's a blank killer. Um like I had yeah. I remember in the 2000s where I saw so many games advertise themselves as Halo killers, and they all ended up falling flat on their face. Mm -mm. Um. I mean, I have to say, there's it's weird talking about these things because in the end, the tabletop role-playing game universe in general, including Dungeons & Dragons as a phenomenon, it's so teeny, tiny, and small. It's a niche of a niche of a niche of a niche in the niche. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about numbers of people that are abysmal. It's really small tribes scattered across the globe that have something in common. And then by the magic of internet, they started discovering each other existence and creating communities. But yeah. it's really a small phenomenon. So uh, it's different uh, saying something is revolutionary in this small area where actually uh, if you ask me there was very little uh, progress design wise for decades i mean from the 70s to the 2000s there were gems here and there some games really had brilliant ideas within them but overall the whole structure how you play what does it mean to play what people do at the table it was kind of the same for everyone. You change the size of the die, the numbers you crunch, but how you do it, what is... It's, symptom, it's meaningful that you could give good advice to be a good player or a good GM across games. Mm -hmm. They were almost universal truths with just small variances. There is, uh, one, there is one major change that I do think has... Has has occurred has occurred throughout the years. Um, through when it came to now, I'm excluding I'm excluding the '70s because that was only half a decade's worth of, of material, so yeah. it that shouldn't really count. When it came to the eight, when it came to the '80s, um, you you had a, you had a lot of people just tr just trying to get just trying to get their just trying to get their feet wet when it came to how when it came to how this kind of thing worked. Yeah. Um, and I'd say I'd say throughout the 80s and 90s, pe there was and there was attempts made to try and shed to try and um to try and hand to try and handle the some a lot of the detail oriented aspects of of where mm -hmm. of um um role playing's predecessor that being war that being war gaming, which it and in the 90s one of the an what. Especially one of the answers that started that was making traction a lot was the very de the very detailed ne um a rule f a rule f a rule or a chart for everything, but yeah. a lot but a lot of um subsystems, and <clears throat> I don't know I don't know when the shift really happened I I I ballpark it around the around the late nineties early two thousands but eventually. Um, there started to be a move away from a series of subsystems into um, a into a all roads lead to Rome approach with design. Mm -hmm. um, and that, like some some of the ones that you mentioned are are a, are a case in point with this kind of thing. Like say um, 
World of Darkness is a, is a case in point of that all roads lead to Rome design because everything revolves around a D, a pool of D10s. Um, and then I'd say I'd say the I'd say in the um, mid 2000s we started seeing the um, the indep the independent scene start to start to em start to emerge a little bit more a little bit more reliably. Mm -hmm. And then, and then, and then the the slow rise of narrativist approaches. But it sounds like your first introduction to um, Apocalypse World was not on the right foot. What was it that um, turned you around on it? Um, basically, instead of uh, talking about something I had no knowledge about, and then. I discovered one thing. Uh, so, what, what to get to the point of your question? What changed things was uh, a convention. I met with people and I played the game, and through practice, I saw what I wasn't able to see before, and that blew me away because I always consider myself an intelligent person uh, and knowledgeable in a way, uh, in at least about role playing games. I was a couple of decades old gamer by the time that happened. So I had my share of experience in various systems that to me look at so widely different. And then these new indie games came, let's call them indie. And um, reading the books, I couldn't understand the point, the differences. Uh, I saw just something very different and judging it with the mold, the shape that I was used to, it just didn't fit. And it looked, felt like pieces were missing, others were obvious and pedantic. Uh, I didn't understand how it could actually work without a lot of uh, the structures and habits uh, that I was used to in traditional role-playing games. Mm -hmm. And then I tried them uh, in person. And I remember the first game I had, the one that really exploded my brain, was a game of Annalise. Um, for those that don't know, uh, Annalise is GMless. Mm -hmm. It's a psychological horror game of reverse vampire stories. So basically, all players at the table play people that will become victims of this malevolent entity. Traditionally, it's a vampire, but through the rules of the game, it can be defined in different ways. It could be an alien, it could be whatever. And at the beginning, it's very vague. And more you play, the more details the story gets and the more concrete and solid and defined this menace, this vampire, uh, becomes until you get to a climatic end that could mean the end and damnation of you or uh, safety and survival. So th there's the whole game. And the mechanics of it were incredible. Uh, I had problems with my friends when I was playing other traditional role playing games. Uh, they showed up, they enjoyed it, I enjoyed it. Because without saying that was usually the game master because it was the only one daring to read English books uh, and trying to learn the rules and explain them to everyone else. So mm -hmm. the one that makes does the work is the one that ends up being the GM. Um, and I was increasingly dissatisfied. I was fed up after 10, 15 years at the time of action things, action adventures, and I wanted action, of course, but with something more. Uh, I think I was very influenced by White Wolf in the promise of something emotional, psychological, horrific in a way, but it always ended up playing like superheroes by night. Um, and sometimes you would get that emotional result but it felt like it was all about the special chemistry that people had at the table in spite of the rules. So 
I, I, I was trying to do different, something different, mm -hmm. and I was failing. Uh, I was, it's there that I started to hack and modify homebrew. Uh, I think most everyone that plays role-playing games does their own homebrew rules at some point or another. But there I was really trying to get something and I was failing. It doesn't matter what I was doing. It was playing the same as usual. And then comes along this analyst game, super small rule book. Uh, to be fair, it was written in a horrible way. I mean, it was very evocative, but procedure-wise, it took some effort to get the game right. Uh, but when you did, or if you had one expert at the table that, as it happened to the convention where I attended, uh, just facilitated the game for everyone else flawlessly, gosh, everyone, uh, we were, first of all, we were all random strangers no connection to one another, which mm -hmm. usually meant at the time uh, stifled, awkward gaming because you don't know each other, you don't know what to prepare for them, how to trigger them in a good way, I mean. So, and instead, really using the few and simple rules of the game because of them, everyone was so incredibly invested. Uh, everyone was avidly devouring each other descriptions because mechanically you could claim them like if i describe that uh, outside it's raining and it's a dark storm you can say cool i claim the dark storm you write it down on a piece of paper and then you can do mechanical things with that later on and so everyone was participating constantly without breaks in the attention uh proactive uh, doing things it was amazing, everything I wanted and more. And then that opened the gate. I started to realize that I couldn't understand the table experience of something I never tried before, before read, uh, just by reading the rule book, because I had no frame of reference. While with traditional ones, the frame is always the same. Uh, some have wildly different rules. I mean, you can compare World of Darkness, whatever, to GURPS or Rollmaster or Traveler. They are wildly different, but design structures are exactly the same. Uh, the GM exists and works in a certain way. Uh, the players have a specific roles and they do it in certain ways. So the, the rules became, in those structures, less important. Call of Cthulhu had uh, something innovative at some point, but I'm not discounting anything in the traditional uh, design space, but uh, the big structures, the underlying currents, what you do at the table and how you do it, was, at least to me at the time, kind of always the same. I knew it. Uh, I was an expert in it. And then come along these other games and they are truly different. So calling them revolutionary might have been a very bad choice of PR and pretentious because, I mean, but they were honestly different and they were breaking things that no one even knows what we're there to break. Mm -hmm. The idea of GMless gaming, of sharing narrative authority, or, for example, the old edition, it's the only one I played, of Aegon, or Agon, actually, because it's mm -hmm. Greek, uh, where the game master is actively antagonistic to the players, and at least to the characters of the players. It, there's no concept of, yeah, you don't win, you don't lose, we all share the story. Yes, that's the eventual outcome. But by the rules, you play against them. Every time they rest, you gain resources and you try to use them to win against them. Uh, you have limits to do so. You are not the omnipotent god of traditional games. You're just another player with different rules. It's asymmetric. So incredible things uh, that no one did before. Uh, they talked about something like that, but they didn't do anything different about that. So 
Revolutionary, no. Honestly, different, yes. And so that the actual practice sparked both my curiosity to know more about other games, and they were incredibly different. I mean, you uh, compare Annalise to The Quiet Year to uh, Apocalypse World, mm -hmm. they don't even look in the same species or planet. Uh, and yet they all are feel like role-playing games. You tell a story, you get engaged, you have characters, uh, you have rules, you have mechanics. And that's what kind of led me to uh, reconsider what I initially dismissed about Apocalypse World. Because that one, for example, felt just bad. Like, it wasn't light and agile like a lot of other indie games of the time. It still had a GM and a lot of rules. It felt like it was doing the same thing as traditional games, but more complicated because everything was explained out in the open and it felt weird. And then again, practice made me notice that, huh, but wait, there's a reason why this is written like this, huh? But this mechanic creates this effect at the table. Huh. And so, bit by bit, it was a big thing to chew. Even at the time, it was a thick book. Mm. Uh, and the writing style had its problems. Um, it was super cool, super evocative, very dirty, apocalypse style, mm. very edgy, nice. But then getting the specific rules and procedures cleared out from that wasn't always so obvious. Uh, Vincent has declared in many occasions that that was by design um, to actually create an effect where only like 30% of the readers would actually grok and get the game. Uh, another 30 would be very dubious and in need of asking external help. And the 30% would just outright hate it and take any occasion they had to diss on it. Mm -hmm. uh, and for him, this was a perfect cocktail. And I think history proved him right, at least in part, uh, to put the game on the map. Yeah. And at the time, it was... Maybe cynical, but, and also, I mean, as a player, I'm suffering because I can't play easily and well because of your PR campaign. But at the time, 11 years ago now, it was maybe not necessary, but I could understand the choice because it was still a time where there was a lot of fights about, ah, this is not even a role-playing game. You can't exist in our hobby you are something different. You don't get the right to say anything else. So there was a need for visibility, let's say. Yeah. Um, now, when now um, when it comes to some when it comes to something like fan, something like fantasy world, um, this is the I've been do, I've been dodging it this whole time. But I can't dodge forever, so I have to address the big elephant in the room who's broken into my house and is taking a crash in the living room. <laughs> Go for the jugular. Uh, it's in yeah. given the fact that given the fact that you are, it is inevitable that people that um, there's going to be a comparison between this project, Fantasy World, and and um, Dungeon World, and. The que the main question that I have in in regard to that is um are is there is um were there in, were there any were I could go, I could go with the whole what's di what's similar and what's different but instead I want to go with what what in what in um Dungeon World or in other or in other um powered by the Apocalypse mm -hmm. games were you trying to respond to with the design in um, Fantasy World? Ah, uh, so many things. <laughs> um, the Fantasy World project initially started actually as a sort of hack of Dungeon World. Mm -hmm. uh, there was um, 
an Italian publisher that had half an idea to try and get the rights to actually publish a Dungeon World second edition or Dungeon World next uh, mm -hmm. game uh, seen as uh, La Torre and uh, Cobble seemed not interested in developing the system more. Uh, so that was the idea at the very original beginning. By that time, uh, when I got contacted for this project, uh, I already was starting to uh, coalesce a bunch of opinions about Powered by the Apocalypse games in general. Uh, it was, I think, five, six years ago, so there was already in existence and circulation a lot of Powered by the Apocalypse games of all shapes and sizes. Uh, and I s was kind of feeling trends. I was kind of feeling that uh, at each one had amazing ideas and a crazy style and a lot of energy and enthusiasm, but all shared a few underlying points of attrition to me personally. Uh, talking with friends, some said, no, I love it because of that. And that's perfectly fine. Uh, but to me, it was starting to feel like it's been 11 years. Why ha haven't things progressed or changed more? Why does everyone does the same? I don't want to call them mis mistakes because, as I said, uh, a lot of people love those games because <laughs> what, to me, uh, felt uh, not so enjoyable. But still, it was kind of vague. And so I got this opportunity and started working on it. Uh, and at the beginning was just specific little things. Uh, but the more I worked on Dungeon World to do what I thought would be a fantasy PBTA that I would really thoroughly like and enjoy, uh, I started basically removing every single bit of the system until nothing was left. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I said, OK, maybe I start from the source. And that's when I used Apocalypse World second edition at the time, was mm -hmm. uh, freshly came out, as an actual base. So there is not one bone of Dungeon World in, uh, in Fantasy World. Unless we consider, and I personally consider it a lot, the cultural heritage and knowledge that it transmitted because it was incredibly successful. It showed how you could do an amazing fantasy game with the bones of Apocalypse World. Uh, it departed from it in significant ways. So it also showed the path for people to say, okay, you can break the mold more. Uh, at the very beginning when it came out, it was not so obvious. Um, and also it, I mean, I'm building on the shoulders of giants. They are mm -hmm. cumulative 11 years of experience and plays and uh, var variations. I got the DNA of it in me as my personal experience. And that shaped my vision of how uh, PBTA fantasy could become. Uh, eventually, the original uh, uh, Dungeon World Next uh, project didn't pan out. Uh, and I was left to my own devices with the game that was in search of a publisher. But like a lot of indie developers, I was doing it more for myself than anything. And that's when I started to pour everything I had into a wiki rule book, open for everyone to play and read and criticize and try out. And that's where the actual true development became because then testing uh, started, uh, feedback started pouring in. Um, and I felt because I didn't have the constraints imposed by the publisher that had a certain idea in mind, uh, I was free to ditch them too and go my own way. Uh, so for example, the, the classic classes, um, or the classic uh, d and statistic names uh, that also Dungeon World uses. Uh, I, uh, the idea that you need a list of equipment, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So that's the beginning of. Uh, 
so the, the, the pain points with Dungeon World specifically or other uh, Powered by the Apocalypse were, I think, first and foremost, the writing style. Uh, I mean, technical writing. Uh, it's, it felt both amazing and horrifying to me that something like, I don't remember the name of it. Uh, if you remember the existence of uh, G+, as a social network. Yes, I am. Um... I weep. I weep for all all the um, all the amazing resources that came out of that came out of the G plus days. Yes, uh, I think a guy started to do this uh, series, the Daily Apocalypse, maybe, where he would post a tiny fraction of the Apocalypse World text and analyze the shit out of it. And it came out with an incredible and incredibly useful insight that, yeah, was in the rule book all along, but was so hard to get at. And that to me felt amazing because the depth and richness of the system, but horrifying. I mean, you shouldn't need to go to this length to learn how to play a damn game and have some fun with your friends. And a lot of other PBTAs kind of suffered a similar uh, problem. Uh, the Veil, it's an amazing and visionary cyberpunk game uh, that allows you to play very different kinds of cyberpunk. It really is a lot of stuff in there. Uh, but how it's written, uh, the moves, they are so difficult to understand you read them, and in your mind, it's obvious what it should do. It's instant. It's very evocative. Then you get to the table, and at least me, in my experience with a couple of groups I tried it with, we were constantly negotiating with each other to understand if the move was being activated, how the outcome was supposed to reflect in the game. You don't you shouldn't spend time on this, on understanding how the game works. Yes, a bit at the beginning, it's inevitable. Role-playing games are complex games. They will never be, or most cases, as simple and immediate as board games. And even board games require a learning curve. But damn, that was a lot of hard work with a final outcome that was still uncertain. And a lot of designers had this attitude of, yeah, whatever floats your table. There's no real truth, just you do you. Which on the one hand, it's nice, be open to different ways to play your game, yes. But I always felt that a designer should give a clear direction. Mm -hmm. Exactly because this way people can say, I like it, I love it, let's do it like that. Or, uh, meh. Now that I know, I can choose to do different. I can modify it and make it my own, homebrew it more easily because I understand better the building blocks. If everything is muddy and up for discussion and undefined, it makes it even harder to get something new from others out of your creation. At least this is how I personally feel. And that was what motivated me to basically say, OK, I want to write something that defies this convention, let's say. Uh, mm -hmm. And then there were a myriad of mechanics like uh, um, hit points and the damage roll in uh, Dungeon World, or how a lot of Dungeon World moves felt like fluff and filler material. Uh, Dungeon World classes have an average of 25, 25 ish moves. And a lot of them are just the same move, but plus one. The same move as before, but now it's plus two. Or uh, you can finally get to do the cool thing, but before that, you have to buy this other move that it's a weaker, less cool version, and you don't really care about it, but it's prerequisite, and so you have to get it. Uh, all of this stuff partly uh, made to, I mean, Dungeon World does its thing very well. Mm -hmm. It's a celebration of Dungeons and Dragons by way of a different system. Uh, 
Uh, it's way more cinematic, in my opinion, than Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, it does its kind of fantasy adventuring very well. It's action, 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 quest, mission, level up. It's very cool and effective in that. Uh, I was just looking for something different. Yeah. Um, I call fantasy world, I describe it when I need a single term, it's dramatic fantasy. Uh, it looks not at other fantasy games, it looks directly at novels, TV series, movies. Uh, and so a lot of the conventions, mechanical, uh, archetypical, narrative, that are perfect in Dungeon World to do its thing, they don't really find space in fantasy world. Uh, and they were not what I was looking for. And that's where I diverged. So. All right, I, I, can, I can get that. And would, with, that, with that kind of thing in mind, um, obviously, since, du since Dungeon World is, for all intents and purposes, tr trying to be a, a um, unholy combination of PBTA and Dungeons and & Dragons with all, of, with all of the quirks of the latter, would it be fair of me to say that with with um, fantasy world you're um, you're you're apl you're applying a bit more of a broader brush in terms of what style of fantasy it's meant to accommodate, i.e. I, um, D and D D and D and subsequently Dungeon World is always going to have difficulty tackling certain styles of fantasy. Like if somebody wants to do sword and sorcery, it's there's going to be some issues. It's not impossible, but there's, but there's going to be some work that has to be done. <coughs> um, with, with unless I'm mistaken, with with fantasy world, you ha you um. Even though you ha even though you ha you have as you have as much of a um as much of support as much of support for people to build the the setting that they want to run in instead of having a half-assumed setting. Yeah. Um, yes. Um, I... Yes, uh, you have more latitude, uh, but there's always... Let's see. Um, I feel that the direct imprint of Apocalypse World is responsible for this. It wasn't, uh, partly at least, it wasn't uh, a design goal at the beginning. It became one later on. Uh, but basically, when you take Apocalypse World, uh, it's made so that you can play any kind of post-apocalyptic uh, setting, um, the style, the pacing, the elements, it could be in the future, in the past, whatever you dress it up with, it will be post-apocalyptic. And this is granted because of the kind of world building at the beginning that sets a few very simple um, firm points, like there is scarcity everywhere, accept fuel and bullets or whatever analog you have in your setting. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't remember what actually caused the apocalypse. It was 50 years ago, meaning enough to don't really know what happened, but maybe enough to have still some traces of it. And the society is still maybe trying to rebuild or it's ripe now to start rebuilding, but there is no status quo new yet. And this mixed with the other mechanics ensures that you can play it fantasy, you can play it in space, it doesn't really matter. It will always be post-apocalyptic. Uh, and by using that as a mold, I basically achieved the same with fantasy. While Dungeon World, uh, trying to look up at D&D in its own way, in its celebration of it, in a way became more specific, more narrow and focused. You can still dress it up however you want, but some things, as you mentioned, will feel a bit, yeah, okay, it's just the dressing, but it doesn't mechanically 
uh, there's ludonarrative dissonance, if we want <laughs> to use this fancy term. Uh, you play and you feel that it doesn't match the experience. Um, while fantasy world, partly thanks to the imprint from Apocalypse World, has this approach. And then uh, the more it got mature and the more I focused the design on, on what I bit by bit understood I wanted because I had some goals at the beginning. By the end, they were different ones. So uh, I also matured in knowing better what I wanted and how I wanted it. Um, it focuses on uh, supporting a specific meta narrative. So uh, on a forum on the gauntlet uh, mm -hmm. during a conversation about fantasy world, the guy asked me if I could offer some reference fantasy novels that would fit and inspire what I was going with fantasy world. And I felt like at a loss for words because uh, I said, oh, but it could be anything in different ways. Uh, I don't really know what to, to answer. To which he, uh, he, he didn't get angry, but it was like, but no, you can't say that it's not generic and can, th there is no such thing and one size fits all. There has to be something that it does well and something that it really you can dress it up like that but it doesn't play like that so it does it's not a good fit and in answering to that i got more into focus my answer and it was you see this is the list of books that i read recently and there was this long list of brandon sanderson tolkien um eric of mandy monet uh Dresden Files, they were all very different, but you could play them with fantasy words effectively. Not a hundred percent replica. That is never the intention, and I can tell you straight away, uh, you will not be able to simulate perfectly a hundred percent one specific source book you want. Maybe some you find that fits very well, the, the shoe. But in general, of course, there will be limits and differences. Mm -hmm. But where Fantasy World allows you to get to a good 80%, which is much more than could be said for other games trying to play in some setting that is not meant specifically for that system, uh, is that the mechanics of Fantasy World are structured to mimic narrative structures and techniques. Mm -hmm. uh, so instead of looking at a setting and thinking, how can I make a fantasy game? That was in the background. That was from uh, Apocalypse World. How can I make fantasy apocalypse, for example? Um, I was looking to how can I have the players and GM of the game play effortlessly without being expert writers and novelists and storytellers a good narrative and so the mechanics are structural they allow you and if you see most of these novels like uh mistborn saga the first book is a heist movie basically uh, it's a heist story in a fantasy setting it has narrative beats of a certain kind. It has character portrayals of a certain kind, but all characters have a personal development, a story arc. They have strengths and weaknesses. They face personal doubts and push uh, and forge forward their personal convictions. Uh, they are people, they are human uh, beyond the, the two limbs and two eyes. I mean, not biological, but psychologically. Uh, so they are well-rounded characters. And the story that comes out of that, you can classify it as a heist story, but it's a story. When you then compare this to whatever Dresden Files book, 
you can see that the kind of story maybe is very different, but it's still a story. There's a narrative structures, there's beats, there's characters, there's story arts, character arts, and everything I just said, it's there again. And it's there again in The Lord of the Rings. And it's there again in Eric of Mendy Monet, which is, by all intents and purposes, the anti-Lord of the Rings. So I'd say, I'll, I'd say, um, I'd say, in, I'd say, in some way, Elric is the is the anti Conan more than anything else. But hmm. um, I haven't read Conan. I only am familiar with the cheesy but very amazing for me Schwarzenegger movies. Uh, but I was at an interview with uh, uh, what's oh my god, sorry the the author of Elric, um, Moorcock. Yes. And Moorcock said candidly, I wrote Eric because I was fed up with Tolkien. Everyone around me was Lord of the Rings land. Nothing else could be written that was not kind of like Lord of the Rings. And then, of course, it was not as good as Lord of the Rings. And so I was fed up with that. And I wrote something that to me was the exact opposite of everything Tolkien did with Lord of the Rings. And I found this endlessly amusing and that's when i actually read the book um, and i kind of agree uh, it's i yeah. will read conan too now because i'm curious to compare um i would say the thing the thing that's trick the thing that's tricky when it comes to conan is that put is is that um the interpret the way conan has been interpreted has cha has changed over time mm -hmm. um a lot, I'd say. Now, obviously, obviously, there's certainly the the um, works from Howard, but I don't. Mm -hmm. I'd also, I'd also be remiss if I did not point out the um, the '80s run with Marvel Comics under um, John Buscema. Uh. Um, and the and the more re and the 2000s run under um, Dark Horse. When a lot of people are talking about interpretations of Conan, those are get, those are going to be the big three that they discuss. Um, while the Schwarzenegger movies are are nice, um, well, the <laughs> yeah. well, um, the first one I should say, Con the <laughs> D Destroyer, I don't have nice things to say about. Um, they don't. The sim the similar. There's a lot of differences between. Between that, between um that, between the approach in those films and and Conan as a character, um, a lot of a lot of those changes were were um John Amelia is trying to work around the things that Arnold could do and the things that Arnold can't do. Yeah. Chief among them being, speak um trying to trying to be <laughs> a speaking actor. <laughs> um, and especially since that that was Arnold's um, Conan the Barbarian was Arnold's second film. Mm -mm. Um, and the first, the first one was Hercules in New York, where he was dubbed over. So luckily, I haven't seen that. Um, although, if you although if you want cheese, you could always you could always grab the um, Hercules film that Lou Ferrigno did in '83. <laughs> oh my! <laughs> the most normal thing in that thing is him throwing a bear into space. Okay. <laughs> oh, it. But, some. But since you mentioned since you mentioned Sanderson, that br that brings me that brings me to to something else, and this is something that's always been a bit of frustration when it, whenever somebody um, argues that their game can can account, can can do any kind of fantasy, and this is why mm -hmm. um, the whole setting issue with D and D has been my whipping boy for twenty years. Um. Consid consider. The fact that Sanderson loves putting his own magic systems in his books. Yeah, um, he does. And gra granted, he's a genius at it, but it, it but it is it is something that he falls back on. Um. And you look at the you look at the magic system you look at magic systems in something like Dungeon World, and it it has it has to. Uh, it it has to abide by its own rules first before you can try and implement the implement the rules of other of other systems. When it comes to fan when it comes to fantasy world, um, 
do you have do you have a specific method in w in which magic is supposed to work, or do you ha or do you have means so that players so that players and GMs could um, tweak it to to the way that they want magic to be interpreted in their setting? Uh, yes, uh, one of the um, discussions on the Kickstarter page that eventually spawned a full-fledged article that can be found on the itch.io uh, page of Fantasy World uh, is alternative classes, new classes of characters uh, for Fantasy World. We unlocked one new class that will be designed by me and Luca Majorani, the other author. Mm -hmm. um, and so we asked our followers, ha, huh, you are pledging for Fantasy World, you like it, uh, you might have ideas probably about it, so speak up, uh, tell us what you would like to see that you feel is missing right now. And we got a ton of answers of all shapes and sizes and kinds. Um, and while a bunch of them pointed to a common trend that uh, eventually became or will become the maker, the new class that we decided to go for, that is about technology and its impact on the fantasy world. Uh, a lot of others were about different shapes and sizes and flavors of magical users. And what I noticed is that actually you could cover all of them, at least 16 of them in the article I wrote, with basic classes without any hacking or very cos light cosmetic soft hacking. And so I went on to kind of explain that. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot of leeway. Also, um, we released uh, just before the beginning of the Kickstarter, a whole quick setting uh, because it didn't make sense to have a quick rule uh, at the beginning uh, because the rules are completely available online anyway, so why bother? Mm -hmm. Instead, we made a quick setting, a pre-made setting that fits, checks all the boxes of the fantasy world structure, uh, but also leverages the power of having material already made for you that you can, can get inspiration or use straight away, etc. And it's a weird setting, and we used it also as uh, an example of what could be accomplished uh, with the basic rules. We didn't add new mechanics, new uh, classes, new moves, nothing. It's all fictional material, which in fantasy world works like uh, mechanical material because it affects the mechanics of the game. And there we have telepaths, psionics, uh, weird magics, uh, technology, cyber technology, uh, and it doesn't require any special uh, rules. There is just one move, uh, the warrior one, which is very inspired to uh, the template of uh, Danger World. This is the only uh, imprint that can still be clearly seen. The, the, mm -hmm. the archetype at the root of most classes, uh, for a bunch of reasons, um, pans uh, um, kind of uh, follows those footsteps, but also those of D&D &D mm -hmm. for various design reasons, uh, if you want later on. Uh, so this way in this article, I basically say, okay, so you want a fire magician, you want a uh, psychokinetic magician, you want whatever, and basically 16 of these ideas, and more actually because some were so similar, I rolled them up into a single answer. You can just do by taking one of the classes that maybe functionally plays more like you would expect what you have in mind, and then recoloring it. Uh, some of the classes, like the occultist, the, the, occultist, the mm -hmm. magician in fantasy world, right off the bat with the two core starting moves that you have at the beginning of the game, they ask you directly a few questions. Uh, what's the source of your magical power? Who taught you that? And what's your relationship to them? And stuff like that. 
And then when you use them, you constantly describe and, if you want, redefine uh, the details of how it looks in the game and in the story. So you do a lot of hand waving, you just mumble something, you use weird materials. Is it about physical shadows rather than burning light, rather than the power of love? It could be any of this. Mm -hmm. It's just description that has a weight and a meaning because the mechanics change based on that, but still it's fiction. And so you can tweak it in a lot of ways. Uh, just today, I asked it to a guy that wanted to make a psychic uh, character, and uh, I suggested not to use the occultist, but actually to go to a normal warrior or the knight and just describe the various moves not as the fruit of martial ability, but as psionic powers. And they fit because they all are not really specifically tied to a specific fiction, but more tied to the narrative structures that that move would ensue, uh, allow to bring to the table. That said, Mistborn and Sanderson in general is very specific mm -hmm. <laughs> and articulate with this magical system. So that might pose a, more, a bit more of a challenge. If you wanted to play Mistborn, if your focus, the definition of Mistborn for you is 100% the magical system with allomancy, uh, eumaturgy, um, and uh, ferrukemi, mm -hmm. uh, that would require probably uh, to be really well uh, represented uh, special moves, new moves, maybe a whole class to represent that. But not necessarily. If that's something that you want represented, but it doesn't have to be a perfect one-to-one -one, uh, copy of it, then you can do a lot with blood, kin, uh, your inner doubt and issue, and the uh, narrative tags that can be attached to characters, equipment, locations, and whatever the normal classes do. So, and then you would end up with a story that feels like uh, the heist movie that is uh, The Final Empire, for mm -hmm. example, with characters that feel and play like uh, the ones from uh, The Final Empire. Yeah, the details on the magic system can be a bit different. It depends the grade, the, the level of accuracy you're looking for. Uh, but there's, that is the only limit I see. And if you take instead some other fantasy story that has a less detailed and strictly defined magical system, then the sky is the limit. And mm -hmm. you don't even need a special new moves to do that. Yeah. Um, now, when it, com now um, when it comes to... <clears throat> When it comes when it comes to the to, when it comes to the um ov the overall size of the project, what are you shooting for as far as a as far as a final um page count? Uh, I think we discussed uh, for the core rule book should be around three hundred pages, mm -hmm. uh, bit more, bit less. I don't remember. Uh, that's uh, the the publisher uh, details. I am very hazy uh, hazy about that. Um, and in the end, depending on how many guest authors we unlock, the Cosmohedron source book uh, will be pretty much the same. All right. And what would you be shooting for as far as a release window for the digital version? I know that the physical version is going to take significantly longer. Um, as far as the publisher told me, and I think it's somewhere also, either in the group or the Kickstarter, but anyway, uh, March 2022 for the physical uh, version, and a bit sooner, January, February, uh, for the PDFs. Uh, right now, the, the game text is almost final. Uh, let's say that the content is final, but it needs uh, 
the uh, English version, native speaker uh, editing and uh, ch what, what's the term? Anyway, someone native to the English language to check that there are no typos, spelling errors. I mean, my English is decent, but I'm sure that a native speaker might object to some uh, word choices or phrase structures, etc. cetera. Uh, we also wanted these, there to be a sensitivity check because we uh, were made aware recently of a small problem that we were completely unaware of. And so we want to be sure that moving forward, if there's anything else, we have a chance to fix it before it gets to the printers. Mm -hmm. um, and then the Italian translation also needs to be checked because I developed directly in English. And so far, the Italian translation was uh, a fun effort uh, from supporters of the game. Uh, so it needs to be, from what I said before, I am a stickler for the text. It has to be technical. It has to be clear. It has to convey what I wanted to convey. And so I need to prove that. Uh, that translation. So that's the big job on the text. And then the book needs to be conjured into existence. Uh, we need to illustrate it, uh, um, lay out the text, uh, and we have big ideas for that. For example, we want it to be also quite accessible uh, as a reading material. Mm -hmm. So it has to be clean and nice, but we also want it to be a little work of art. So we want to have each chapter have a different uh, root color, let's say, and that would be the main element of the pages of that uh, chapter without getting in the way because colored pages can be a pain in the ass to read. Mm. We want to avoid that, we are aware. But still, when you have the book closed, the cost of the book should look like a rainbow because every chapter is inspired to a different uh, kind of fantasy uh, and so a different main color. And so these kind of details we want to put into the, into the book. And this takes time and effort. And then, of course, there's the problem of printing and shipping something in the time of pandemic. So the, the timeline gets stretched. Mm -hmm. Uh, but supposedly the publisher, MS Edizioni, is very good at doing this stuff. They calculated this beginning of 22 uh, timeline. I hope there's no delays. I trust them. Uh, they've been working very well so far. So, and, uh, and so, yeah, this is the ideal timeline, at least. Uh, another thing that I don't have the right timeline on right now, but it's going to be worked on as soon as the Kickstarter ends completely. So uh, tomorrow and then the next week for picking up the last bits. Um, the online wiki. Mm -hmm. uh, it's already planned a complete overhaul of it so that it's more accessible, nicer looking, uh, includes the text that has been updated and fixed and typo proofed until now. And as both the translations get improved, uh, the site will be updated. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, and that should happen sooner rather than later. All right, I can, I can, cer I can certainly get behind that. And I do want to offer my congratulations for how well, for how well it's done because you're only asking for um, five thousand euros and you're close to um, thirty thousand. Yeah, that was thank you. First of all, uh, we're very happy, and uh, uh, that's the magic of actually having a publisher. They can manage cost, absorbs others, uh, guide you in the process. Uh, and I have to say, I was a bit scared at the beginning because uh, working with a publisher of a certain size uh, comes usually with strings attached. Uh, but uh, Enrico and the other guys from MS Edizioni have been anything but uh, 
supportive and open, discussing everything and making choices together. Uh, and swallowing something that they were not really convinced of, but then they trusted me, uh, like the having the whole game for free from day one online. Uh, they were not so convinced, uh, but I insisted and they said, OK, let's do it your way. So I didn't expect that to be so easy. Uh, so I think they did a great job and made this Kickstarter possible in the first place. Otherwise, it would be just me without, uh, maybe with decent, uh, actually very good art, because Luca is behind that. And uh, his illustrations have apparently resounded incredibly with uh, the people uh, uh, playing the game and looking into it. Um, but then we wouldn't have the means before to help uh, how a lot of the logistic costs and problems and time consuming, just time consuming shenanigans that if you do a Kickstarter, you have to, to shoulder. Mm -hmm. So, well, like I said, I'll be, I'll be keeping a close eye on how, on how things develop from here on in. But thank you. With all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the um, shenanigans at play here. <laughs> Don't worry, and, it's been a pleasure. And, thank you for inviting me. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Thanks. That's a very good uh, axiom to live by. Yep. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>